Are you struggling to get a professional sounding mix in GarageBand? It's not GarageBand's fault. It's probably not even your fault. The secret mix killer is not having a plan when you start your mixing. In this video, I'm gonna share with you the six step process that many professional mix engineers use to get the best mix possible and how you can follow these steps in GarageBand. Welcome to the Band Guide. I'm your band guy, Colin. Let's step up your mixes. Before we jump into the steps, it's important to remember the whole goal of mixing, and that's to create one stereo file that sounds professional, radio ready, and showcases the music. People will never hear the individual tracks. They're only ever gonna hear that final stereo file. So don't become too laser focused on any individual element and keep the holistic singular mix as the goal. This six step process is designed to help you keep that holistic process in mind. So be sure to follow along with the steps in order. They build on each other. So try to nail each step before you move on to the next. It's okay once you're into the next step to go back if you need to fix something that you're now hearing. This is a living, breathing mix, so don't become too worried about that, but definitely never skip any steps. Try to really nail each step before you move on to the next one. I've put together a free six step checklist that follows along with these steps. There's a link in the description below, so be sure to download that. It's completely free. That way you can be sure you're nailing each one of these steps the next time you're mixing. Okay, let's step it up for real this time. Step one, the static mix. The whole goal of the static mix is to get the best mix possible with only volume and panning. No plugins allowed. Do not touch a plugin in this step. Be sure you're getting the low end, the clarity, and the width that you want in your mix before you move on from this step. This is a crucial step. Don't rush this step. If you skip or rush this step, you're killing your mix before it even gets started. You're gonna spend forever trying to EQ and process your tracks to get more bass, to get more clarity, when all you needed to do was maybe turn that bass guitar up another decibel or pan that guitar a little bit more to the right to hear it better. Start by looping the loudest part of the song, then bring all of your volume faders to zero, your pan knobs to center, and start bringing them up in order of importance. Typically I start with vocals and then maybe kick and snare, and then bring in the other instrumentation around that and then pan to make sure you're getting the width that you want. It's important you start with the loudest part for two reasons. One, you want the loudest part to hit the hardest. Two, if you start in a quieter part, when you get to the louder part, there's a good chance it's going to be peaking on your master meter. That's not good, that's gonna cause digital distortion and that sounds bad. And this brings me to my first tip. Download the MV Meter 2 plugin from TB Pro Audio. Don't worry, it's totally free. GarageBand is great, but it doesn't have any real metering built in, so you can't accurately gauge the exact volume and levels of different elements of your mix. Set this as the last track on your master track. Open up the plugin and select the peak standard preset. Then keep this plugin up the whole time you're working on your static mix and make sure that you're never ever hitting above negative three in that bottom right corner where it says max. That should never hit above negative three. In general, I actually aim for negative six. As long as your loudest part is never going above negative three, you're groovy. Tip two, take advantage of LCR panning. What is LCR panning? Left, center, right panning. The idea is this. If you want a wide mix, you have to pan wide. You can't pan things only at 50% and then have a really wide sounding mix. Select some things in your tracks that you want to be panned 100% right or left. Obviously your vocals and a lot of things are gonna be up the center already, but don't be afraid to put one guitar part or one piano part all the way out to the far left or all the way out to the far right. This is crucial for getting a wide mix. And then some other things you can pan 40%, 50%. Not everything has to be LCR, but don't be afraid of LCR panning. Next, take a break. You wanna take a few minutes to let your ears reset before you move on to step two. Step two, master track processing. This is what's known as top-down processing. Once you've finished your static mix and you're happy with it, listen back to it as a whole and decide do I want a little more brightness in this mix or is there maybe a little too much low in mud in the low mids? Check against some reference tracks, some professionally mixed track. Be sure to set the levels similarly so the professional mixes aren't louder, but decide is my mix maybe not as bright as theirs. Now we're not gonna completely fix these in this phase, but if we make small tweaks here, we'll be doing less work on individual tracks and that will sound more professional and more natural. 
There are two main steps in master track processing, EQ and compression. With EQ, we have two goals, minimize the bad and highlight the good. Subtle changes. We don't want to be doing more than maybe around two decibels in either boosts or cuts. And you want to find frequencies that maybe aren't sounding too good for you, cut those a little bit, and then find frequencies that do sound better to you and boost those a little bit. Ask yourself why before you do these. Do I want a little more brightness? Do I want a little less mud in the low mids? and focus on those, find those frequencies, and just make subtle cuts. Those cuts and boosts affect every track in your mix. So now, as opposed to adding a shelf on every single channel that needs a little more brightness, you've already done that with a 1 dB shelf on the master track. The goal of compression on the master track is glue. We're just trying to gel the tracks together a little bit here. If you go overboard on this, you're gonna smash your mix and it's gonna be dull and lifeless. So just be very, very subtle. I recommend using the second compressor that's already listed in your GarageBand plugin chain on the master track because this one gives you the lights that are a visual indicator. With that compression, we want to have subtle elements. So we want a slow attack, typically 10 milliseconds plus, so 10 milliseconds or more, and we want a really light ratio. I'm typically looking for 1.8 to one or two to one. And then just bring the threshold down until the light indicator is giving you one to two, maybe three lights ticking on in the loudest part of your song. And that's it, step two is done. Take just a couple minutes to break before you move on to step three. Rest your ears, get a little water, walk around. That way your ears are reset before you jump into step three. Step three, EQ. It took us three steps, but we're finally putting plugins on individual tracks. Crazy. We have three goals when using EQ on individual tracks. Minimize the bad, highlight the good, and make space for every source. I recommend starting with subtractive EQ. Obviously, subtractive EQ is good when we're trying to minimize the bad, but it's also good to highlight the good. Let's say, for example, you want a little more brightness on the vocals. Well, as opposed to just adding a shelf, maybe try cutting some low mids from the vocals and see if that helps. And then if that doesn't, or maybe you just want a little more brightness even still, add another shelf at that point. Don't be afraid to add shelves, don't be afraid to boost some frequencies, but start with subtractive EQ and see if you can cut out things that are bad. After you've finished with your EQ, be sure to level match your EQ. So when you bypass the EQ plugin and when you turn it back on, it's the same volume on the track. Our ears tend to prefer louder signals, so we would prefer the sound with the EQ on, even if it's not necessarily better. Or if you took away a lot of frequencies, our ears might prefer the un-EQ'd signal because now this track has less volume. So be sure to level match the volume with the plugin bypassed and on. This is also really important because we don't want to mess up our static mix that we established. We want to keep the same relative volume of each individual track in our mix. When it comes to making space, there's two main ways to do this. The first way is to cut any frequencies that your channel doesn't need. For example, kick and bass are typically the main sources that need frequencies 100 hertz and below. So other channels, if they don't need those frequencies, go ahead and cut all those frequencies out. Use a high pass filter and cut it out. If you have 50 tracks and only your kick and bass need low end, then you have 48 tracks that might be adding low end and getting in the way of the kick and the bass. So if you had a high pass filter on those 48 other channels, you're making a lot more space for that kick and bass to shine through and sound awesome. I typically approach this by putting my high pass filter on my EQ, pulling it up until I hear the signal starting to sound a little bit thinner, and then pulling it down so it's not affecting the parts of the sound that I want to hear. The second way to make space is what I like to call complementary EQing. This is where, let's say you have two guitar signals that are in the same range. I would find a frequency on one guitar that sounds really good, and I maybe boost it one or two dB. And then I would go over to the other guitar channel, and I would cut it one to two dB on that same frequency. What I've effectively done here is added four dB of dynamic range for that frequency that sounds good on that guitar. I've just allowed that guitar to shine through and cut through better in the mix. This can also be really helpful if you have a lot of vocals in a track. Not all the vocals need to be bright. If you keep that lead vocal with all the brightness that you want and then cut some of the brightness from the other backing vocals, you'll actually get more clarity in that lead vocal. My big tip for you with EQ is don't EQ every channel. You probably don't need to. Ask yourself before you put that EQ on, why? Why am I adding this EQ? What is my goal with EQing this channel? 
And if you don't have a reason, if you don't have anything to say, don't put it on. You probably don't need it. Time for another break. Reset your ears and let's move on to step four, compression. Compression is often discussed and rarely understood. We have two main goals when working with compression. Control the dynamics and add presence. My biggest tip when working with compression is don't compress every track because you should. You shouldn't. I always end up with a little compression on my vocals. I always end up with some form of compression somewhere on my drum mix. I tend to have a little compression on the bass guitar, making it a little bit more even and full throughout the song. And then other than that, it ebbs or flows in every mix. I might not use compression on any other of my individual channels. Step five, effects. Now we're onto the fun stuff. Well, I think it's all fun, but effects are just cool. I wanna point out we're five steps in and just now adding reverb to channels. I think this is one of the biggest mistakes that early mixers make, and that's to throw reverb on super early in the mixing process. It can really cloud your judgment when you're trying to do a lot of the earlier steps. So wait until you get to step five before you start putting reverb or delay on your channels. Our goals with effects are to add a realistic or interesting space within our song and to add interest. Professional mixes vary in what and how they use effects, but there are definitely four effects that are most commonly used in professional mixes. The first is a short to medium room reverb sound. The second is a medium to long reverb sound. The third is a slapback echo or delay. And the fourth is a timed echo or delay. You can't create your own effects sins in GarageBand, but GarageBand is actually set up for for you. So in every smart control channel, you'll notice on the right side, there's two knobs, an ambience knob and a reverb knob. The ambience knob is gonna be a short to medium room reverb sound. The reverb knob is gonna be a medium to long reverb sound. And then you also on the left side have a master reverb and a master echo. That gives you four effect sends that you can control within your mix. I tend to use the ambience reverb as my short room reverb that's on almost all of my tracks. Be really careful here, don't add too much. One of the worst things you can do with reverb is add too much. It just starts to wash out your mix and make everything sound really distant and not present. The master echo is a great option for your longer delay and the master reverb can be a great reverb option as well. Notice that GarageBand doesn't have a slapback echo built into any of those four sends. I typically only ever use slapback on the lead vocal. So my workaround for this is to duplicate the lead vocal track, and then I'll add a stereo delay on the last channel of it, set my settings to be really, really fast with a little bit of width between the left and right ear, and then I set my wet knob to 100%, and now this channel is effectively a slapback echo send that I can mix in underneath the lead vocal to add the stereo width and warmth from the slapback echo to my lead vocal sound. Again, be subtle with all of these effects. You don't wanna overdo it and have too much reverb and ultimately end up clouding the mix that you spend all the time getting to sound really full and punchy before you started adding effects. Here we are, step six. If this video has been helpful for you, be sure to subscribe and click that bell. I'm back every week with pro level audio tips for GarageBand. Also, be sure to grab that free checklist that's below so you can follow along with these six steps next time you're mixing. Step six. Automation. Automation tells your software to turn things up and down at different points in your mix. This is extremely helpful for making sure everything is the exact right volume at every point in the song. It also allows you to add interest or add different effects that come in at different points in the song. Probably the most common form of automation is writing vocals. That's where you just follow the volume fader along for the entire song and make sure that you can hear every word crystal clear. This is really important for a professional sounding vocal. It's also really common to just automate different levels for different instruments at different points in the song. For example, an electric guitar might be really loud in the chorus and that sounds awesome, but then when you get to the verse, it's just too loud and it's overpowering the verse. So you can use automation to turn it down when you get to that verse. Or let's say you have a delay that's working really well in the chorus, but it's not working in the verses. You can automate that delay to come up in the choruses and back down in the verses. You can also use automation to affect the panning. So let's say you want your guitar to be really far off to the left in the chorus, but then you want it back into the middle or closer to the middle for the verses. You can use automation to pan it far left in the chorus and bring it back towards the center for the verse. 
You can also use automation to add interest. One of my favorite things to do is play with the mix level of reverb at different points in the song. So maybe we get to the bridge and all of a sudden there's a huge amount of reverb on all the drums, or maybe the vocals have a huge amount of reverb that come in. My big tip for automation is assume you're going to have to automate. Plan time at the end of your mixing to automate. At minimum, you're likely going to have to ride the vocal channel to make sure that you can hear every word clearly, but you also are likely going to have to do some of those volume or panning or effect automations to really make an excellent mix that sounds professional. All right, we did it. Six steps to a pro mix in GarageBand. Now I'm gonna challenge you, go do this. Download the checklist in the description and follow along with these six steps on your next mix. And then come back and leave me a comment and let me know, did it help you? Was it terrible? I wanna hear from you. Let me know in the comments below. This approach to mixing has been extremely helpful to me. And I think it's great for people who are just starting out in mixing because it walks you through steps in a really clear and important way. But it's definitely by no means the only approach to mixing. So if you've made professional mixes that you're happy with, what's been your approach? Leave me a comment, let me know so we can all learn from you. Be sure to download the checklist below, subscribe and click the bell, and we'll see you soon with another video.